thank you all for coming. Um, my name is Jean Olson, and today I'm going to be talking about the biomechanics of cephalopods and how that relates to soft robotics. So I'm a research scientist at Carnegie Mellon, and I specialize in robotics, um, and particularly in soft robotics. Uh, but I realized that soft robotics isn't exactly a common term, and neither is cephalopod. So I want to start just by introducing these terms. So cephalopod comes from a Greek word that means head foot, and it's a class of animals that includes the octopus, cuttlefish, nautilus, and squid. And these creatures share a number of common traits, but the one of interest in this talk is that they all have a set of boneless arms or tentacles. So on the soft robotic side, the basic idea behind soft robotics is to incorporate some kind of softness or compliance, much like biological creatures have. Um, and they're often bio-inspired, whether it be by a snake, a fish, or the octopus itself. Um, the octopus and other cephalopods are one of the most common bio-inspiration for soft robots, and their form is com commonly mimicked. Um, so what I'm going to do in this talk is explore that connection a little more and explain why the octopus is so different from other creatures, particularly terrestrial creatures, and why it's so relevant to soft robotics. So muscle is our most basic building block, and biological muscle, whether in a human or an octopus, contracts when activated, and it can also passively extend. So this is an example of an endoskeleton, uh, which is a very common support structure, particularly for terrestrial creatures. Muscle is attached to bone, and the bones are connected to joints. The muscle pulls on the bone, which creates motion in the joint. If we look at cephalopods, though, they are not uh, creatures that are supported by an endoskeleton, and they move very differently. And this is apparent in just a few examples. So swimming motion produces a very smooth bend that straightens out. Um, octopi can also use their arms to crawl along the ocean floor, forming their arms into these tight curves that almost act like feet. Um, and along that same trend, oct octopi can grasp onto things with the upper part of their arms and then use the lower part of their arms to walk across the ocean floor. And this next example doesn't really show anything different. It's the same basic principles, but I really like this video, so I always show it. Um, and it basically what it shows is that octopi can be incredibly fast and powerful. Um, but thing is, their arms have no bones to pull against. And that's true for the arms and, and tentacles for cuttlefish, nautilus, and squid as well. And so the question is, um, how do they move? So if we take a look at the anatomy of cephalopod limbs, we'll focus on their muscles and the, their arrangement. Um, but first I'd like to introduce just two more terms. Um, and the first is a hydrostatic skeleton. And this, the idea behind a hydrostatic skeleton is that it replaces bones with tubes filled with water. And um, worms use have a hydrostatic skeleton. Water is a really great way for soft creatures to transfer force because it's basically incompressible. So when you press in one direction, it has to move in another in order to maintain the same volume. So in the example of a worm, uh, worms will squeeze their diameter, which extends their lengths, and that's how you see that peristaltic motion that a worm will go through. Cephalopods take it one step further, and that's the second term, which is a muscular hydrostat. It basically is a type of muscle that has that incompressible property of water. Um, so cephalopod arms and tentacles essentially are all muscle, and they move by muscle pulling on muscle. And this might seem a little bit strange, but actually you have a muscular hydrostat um, in your body. Um, almost all tongues um, yeah, are also muscular hydrostats and use a very similar principle to move. So there are three basic groups of muscles within an octopus arm. The first is the longitudinal muscles, which are small bundles of muscle that run down the length. The second is transverse muscles, which run crossways in a, a 
across the arm. And then the third is the helical muscles, which wrap around the outside at an angle. And so these different groups acting together can create a vast array of motions that are composed of combinations of simple motions. The arms can at any point contract, extend, bend, or twist. So I'm gonna look at each of these in a little more depth, but there are three key principles that guide the biomechanics of cephalopod limbs. The first is that biological muscle contracts when engaged. There is no form of biological muscle where the muscle fiber extends. It always contracts when engaged. And the second key principle is that muscular hydrostats maintain a constant volume. So when it contracts in one direction, it has to extend passively in another. And the third principle is that muscle tissue is relatively stretchy when it's not being used. So it's soft and easy to deform. So let's look at our first motion, which is contraction. Um, and this is done using the longitudinal muscles, which remember they run down the length of the arm. So you contract these muscles and the arm contracts. Extension though is a little more complicated because muscle fiber only contracts. But the transverse muscle fiber, because it runs crossways across the arm, when you contract it, it produces longitudinal extension in order to maintain that constant volume principle. So if you start with this circle of large diameter and then contract it across its diameter, it has to get longer in order to maintain that volume. So the third motion of bending actually takes two muscle groups. It requires the longitudinal muscles and the transverse muscles, which, you know, it might be seen like, well, why does it take two sets of muscle groups? If we just shorten the muscles, the longitudinal muscles on one side of the arm, say this side, that would force the arm to bend, right? Well, here's where we get to that third principle, which is that um, biological muscle is easy to deform. So shortening simply along one side would produce a shear and not a bend. So in order to maintain, um, in order to get a bend, we have to maintain our diameter, which we do, the octopus does by um, stiffening the transverse muscles, essentially preventing a length change in the diameter and forcing a bend. And so it takes the co-contraction of two different muscle groups. So bends are formed statically in that way. Um, but what later studies of the octopus have shown is that some motions, and such as the one that's shown here, which is a dynamic bending motion, where a bend starts at the beginning uh, near the octopus's body and then forces out to reach something, is actually created by first forming the bend using the principle that we just talked about, and then second by stiffening all the muscles in a propagating wave. So you can imagine here, the bend is formed here, and then the muscles up the arm are stiffened, which when they're entirely stiff, they're forced to be straight, and that propagates the bend outward. So the last core um, motion is twisting, which is accomplished by the helical muscles. So engaging one set of helices produces twist in that direction. But the key thing to note here is as we shorten one helix, the helices on the, in the opposing direction have to lengthen, which biological muscle is quite good at, uh, but will be important when we talk about soft robotics. So twisting is needed both to orient the suckers and to stiffen the arm, such as in the dynamic bending motion that we discussed a few slides ago. So in conclusion here, we have cephalopods and they move by muscle pulling on muscle. And that lets them do a number of crazy motions because their arms have no, um, no bones. They can 
pattern them in different ways and create these versatile motions such as walking along the ocean floor. And again, because they're soft, they can fit themselves into extremely tight spaces. Okay, so that's the cephalopod part of the talk. So now let's talk about soft robots. And really, if we strip away all the fancy talk around soft robots, the basic idea is wouldn't it be awesome to have a robot that is as cool as an octopus? Just checking. Um, just okay, it looks like I have a question. Are all cephalopods able to regrow their muscles like the octopus? That's a good question, and I do not know the answer to that. Um, yeah, it's a good question. Um, okay, so for soft robots, our, if our goal basically is to, is to make a robot that looks like the octopus, we still need our basic building unit, which is an artificial version of biological muscle. And there are a number of soft actuators, but the ones that I'll talk about most here are these kind that are made, they're driven by pressure. And essentially you can just think of them as balloons with fibers wrapped around them. So you inflate them and um, <clears throat> once they've been inflated, they experience this volume change. And because they have fibers wrapped around it, they have to deform in a specific direction. And what this essentially is, is if you've ever played with a finger trap, where you know when you um, pull it out, it tries to contract its diameter, you push it in, it gets bigger. Essentially, a McKibben actuator is just a finger trap that we have put a balloon inside. And so like biological muscle, it has some extension, but it's not nearly as much as biological muscle, but it is quite soft in its passive contraction. One of the things we have available to us in soft robotics that isn't available in biological creatures is we can create soft artificial muscles that extend when activated using a very similar principle. We have some kind of balloon that we inflate and we reinforce it in a way to force that inflation to create an extension. And so a number of octopus inspired robots have been developed. This is a small set of ones um, and they move something like this. So let's do the same thing and look at the different motions and how they're created. So the first motion that we talked about was contraction, which like in cephalopods, contraction of a soft robot arm can be created with longitudinal actuators. You contract the actuators and that contracts um, the robot arm. And so when we look at extension, recall that the cephalopods create extension by transverse contraction, right? So they, they pull in a diameter and that forces an extension. Well, soft robots have a few different methods, but they aren't really replicating the octopus in this case. So the first method is to just use an extending actuator. Um, and so we can get some extension and contraction, but the downside of using this method versus the biological approach is that we have a relatively limited amount of extension or contraction. The second method is to try to more directly replicate the transverse and to have an actuator that contracts in one direction and extends in another. And so this example, if you look at the red muscles, you can see a slight extension and I'll play that again just in case it was a little hard to see. But it's not a lot. And the reason that it's not a lot in this case um, is that we're running into that lack of passive extension within our artificial muscles. So biological muscle extends quite a lot, but our artificial muscles don't extend that much. Um, and that's um, a limitation in, in soft robotics currently and an open research challenge is can we create an artificial muscle that it has a powerful contraction while also um, passively stretching. And so if we look at bending now, um, we can create bending in a soft arm um, using a similar method to the way the octopus does, okay? So we'll have our McKibben actuator, we'll pressurize it uh, to shorten it, and that creates a bend. 
And if we want to change the direction of our bend, we can just pressurize another actuator and I, that will change it. Um, but remember that I said before that bending in cephalopods is actually a co-contraction. It requires that the transverse muscles be stiffened to prevent shearing. And in the case of soft robots, we're not really to that point yet where we have both really capable transverse uh, actuators and longitudinal. So currently soft robots primarily use rigid plates and ties to mimic the function of a stiffened transverse muscle. And so again, just returning to some examples of what this motion looks like. This essentially is a soft arm that is gripping a basketball and lifting it. So here we come to another sort of open research question. And the question is, you know, we have bioinspiration, and I think you heard in a prior, a prior talk also, there's biomimicry. So currently most soft robot arms will use just three actuators um, around the outside, but biological creatures tend to use more, far more. And so the question is, should soft roboticists be following a inspired approach where we mimic the form, but um, follow our own architectures beyond that, or trying to strictly replicate what uh, cephalopods do. And so our last muscle group in motion is the helical muscle, as well, which creates the torsional motion. And here again, we run into that limitation of passive extension. So we can take contracting actuators and wrap them around the outside of some kind of soft arm and create some torsion, but recall that what, what is needed for that then is for the opposing muscle group to extend quite a lot, which we simply don't have actuators that can do right now. And so we look sort of at the state of soft robotics uh, overall and particularly um, octopus inspired soft robots. Individual soft robots have mimicked some of the motions, but there isn't really yet a soft robot that mimics all of the motions of a cephalopod limb. But some of the same principles that I've talked about here are used in other soft robots, such as bending via a local length change, even if they aren't mimicking the entire octopus form. So in this case, there's a, a soft robot that essentially has a stiffer piece and then a softer piece, so it bends and uh, inflates here and is stiff here, and that creates the bend, which I'll skip ahead in the video so you can see here, lets it do different motions like this to move under a, um, a small obstacle. And then additionally, uh, a soft swimming robot, essentially the only part of this that is soft is the tail. And this is just that same bending motion, um, uh, far simpler than an octopus arm in all of its motions, but a very effectively mimicking uh, swimming. And so sort of as a conclusion to this, um, cephalopod biomechanics um, can serve as both an inspiration and a guide to making soft robots move more effectively, but we have a long way to go to match the octopus. Um, it's definitely a field that is actively being researched. And if you have interest in it, I would definitely encourage you to look for research opportunities or lab volunteer to get some more experience with it. That I will take any questions. Thank you, Gina. The question is, what would you study to be in this field? It's a good question. Um, so there are a couple different routes into soft robotics, but it, it's pretty much engineering. Um, but within engineering, you know, it's pretty, you know, there's applications for the mechanical side, for the electrical side, um, for computer science. Um, so I personally came through mechanical engineering. Um, but uh, certainly if your interests are more focused towards electrical engineering or maybe computer science, there are still problems within, within soft robotics that are very much in need of those skills. There are also a few soft roboticists that came to the field through biology. Right. Does anyone have any more questions? Uh, you're, feel free to unmute if you do. 
<laughs> that's not exactly a, a question, elephant trunks. But yes, you're quite right. Elephant trunks use a very similar form of um, very, very similar muscle structure um, and are guided by very similar mechanics. Okay, I think there are no more questions. Thank you so much, Gina, for that lovely presentation. Uh, I've definitely learned a lot. So that is basically the conclusion of our National Biomechanics Day event. This is the first time we've held it at Carnegie Mellon. So we were, we were really excited that so many of you decided to join us today. So this was this is a great event. I learned a lot. I had a lot of fun. I hope everyone else did too. But um, thank you everyone for attending. We do have a feedback survey that we would really appreciate if everyone can fill it out. It is anonymous, but would give us the um, opportunity to improve for this for the coming years. This is planned to be an annual type of event. So be sure to be on the lookout in January or um, March of next year to hear back for next year's Biomechanics Day. I believe the link to the feedback survey has been posted in the chat. And this link is also on Canvas if you, if you can't find it um, today in the chat as well. And so if there's any more last minute questions, please let us know. If you have questions afterwards, please send us an email and we'd love to get back to you and um, talk more about biomechanics. It's definitely a passion of all of the people that presented today. So we, we're, we're really excited when we get more questions about it. Yeah, so thank you everyone. And we hope to see you next year. Thanks everyone. It was great virtually seeing you. Thank you.